Hi, welcome to How Spherical Is Your Cow? Let's start with defining a term used in physics circles, the spherical cow. The spherical cow is an approximation that clearly neglects some important real-world effects. It's pretty clear that a real-world cow is not a sphere. So, in asking the question, how spherical is your cow, what I mean is, how good or poor is your approximation? Okay, here's the main point of this video. It's very important to know how good your approximation is. Okay, here's a basic outline of what we're going to cover in this video. First, we're going to talk about why knowing how good an approximation is, is important. Then we'll talk briefly about what goes into knowing how good an approximation is. And then we'll give an example from physics. We'll look at the expression for the kinetic energy of an object in Newtonian mechanics. There are a couple of videos available on this channel that are related to this one and that you might want to check out. The first is just called Spherical Cows. The second is related to the role of spherical cows in particle physics and is called The Standard Model is Probably a Spherical Cow. Okay, with that, let's start talking about why knowing how good your approximation is matters. Approximations are an incredibly useful tool for problem solving. They can take a complicated problem and make it tractable. So we can take a very complicated system and approximate it as a much greatly simplified system, represented here as a spherical cow. Or we can approximate it as a slightly less simplified system, represented here as a cow built out of a sphere with some appendages stuck on. But approximations are useful only if they are reliable. What do I mean by this? So let's say you're trying to predict some phenomenon. And let's say it's some fairly well understood thing that you're trying to predict, like how a component in a machine will function, or some object's trajectory, something like that. Let's say you have a set of well-tested principles upon which to base your prediction. But, in using these principles to make your prediction, you make some approximations. So, we could ask some questions in this situation. How reliable is your prediction? What is the error bar on your prediction as a result of your approximations? And thus, how closely should you expect your prediction to reflect reality? Alternatively, let's say you're trying to test some hypothesis experimentally. Your hypothesis makes some prediction, but you've used some approximations in calculating what that prediction is. How accurate are those approximations. If the experimental result strongly disagrees with your calculation, is it because the experiment strongly disagrees with your hypothesis? Or did your approximations throw off your calculated prediction of the hypothesis? It's important to understand the limits of the approximations. In both of these scenarios, you're making a prediction. That prediction has an error bar attached to it, and any approximations that were used feed into this error bar. So in order to know how precise your prediction is, you need to understand your approximations. Basically, knowing how good your approximation is, is like knowing the error bar on a measurement. With no knowledge of how good your approximation is, you can't assess how well any calculations that use it will agree with reality. Or, in other words, 
if you're trying to understand this physical phenomenon and you think you're using an approximation that is this good, but your approximation is actually only this good, then problems can result. Okay, so let's talk briefly about what evaluating how good your approximation is entails. Knowing how good your approximation is is often not an easy task. It involves asking some important questions, such as what details does the approximation include and what does it leave out? Of the effects that the approximation leaves out, which are the largest? How large are the largest emitted effects? And is the size of these effects smaller or larger than what is allowed by the precision needed for the situation at hand? Okay, now let's look at a specific example. Let's look at the expression for kinetic energy in Newtonian mechanics. Okay, in Newtonian mechanics, the kinetic energy of an object is most commonly written as mv squared over two where m is the object's mass and v is its velocity. Also in Newtonian mechanics, the momentum p equals m times v. So we can rewrite the kinetic energy mv squared over two as p squared over two m. This latter expression is the one we'll use here. Okay, so now we're going to look at the fact that Newtonian mechanics is an approximation to special relativity. And we're going to ask, how good is the Newtonian approximation? And when is it okay to use? So here we're going to look at how good an approximation the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy is compared to a more accurate relation derived from special relativity. In doing so, we should, in principle, keep in mind that special relativity is itself an approximation. We'll be ignoring gravity, potentials, quantum mechanical effects, etc., which here we'll take to be even smaller effects than those of special relativity. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Newtonian mechanics is a limiting case of special relativity. So we're going to derive the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy from the more fundamental energy momentum relation in special relativity. Additionally, we'll get the largest correction term that one should add on to the Newtonian expression to better approximate the more precise relation. So we'll take the Newtonian expression, represented here as a spherical cow, and calculate the largest correction which should be added to it to make it closer to the more correct expression. We can then use this correction term to find out how far off the Newtonian expression is from the more precise relation. This will tell us how good the Newtonian approximation is. Okay, so as we said, we're going to take the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, and figure out how good this approximation is by computing the correction to it from special relativity. Here, for clarity, we should point out something. Namely, asking how good the approximation kinetic energy equals p squared over 2m is is not the same thing as asking how good the approximation kinetic energy equals mv squared over 2 is. This is because the Newtonian relation p equals mv is itself an approximation that does not hold in special relativity. So the Newtonian relation p squared over 2m equals mv squared over 2 is itself an approximation.
we could take either of these expressions for the kinetic energy as the Newtonian expression. Here, we're using the expression that's in terms of P, not the one that's in terms of V. The reason is simply that it will be easier to compare with the expression we derive from special relativity. Because the two expressions are not equivalent, how good the Newtonian approximation is does depend on which one we decide to call the Newtonian expression. But either way, the order of magnitude of the relativistic correction will be the same. Okay, in special relativity, the energy of an object squared is equal to c squared p squared plus c to the fourth power times m squared. Here, c is the speed of light. We can take the square root of both sides to get an expression for the energy. We should note that for the case where the momentum p is zero, this just gives E equals mc squared, which is a relation you've probably heard before. Okay, we can take that expression for the energy and pull a factor of c out front, leaving p squared plus c squared m squared under the square root sign. For everyday situations, the p squared term is much smaller than the c squared m squared term. This is because p is approximately mv, so p squared is approximately m squared v squared, and v is much, much smaller than c. Okay, so here we have our expression for the energy from the previous slide. Let's take the factor of m squared c squared inside the radical out front. This gives us that the energy equals mc squared times the square root of p squared over c squared m squared plus 1. Okay, so here is our expression from the previous slide. For everyday situations, p squared is much less than c squared m squared, so the second term under the square root is much less than 1. So for everyday situations, the energy is of the form mc squared times the square root of 1 plus x, where x, which is p squared over c squared m squared, is much less than 1. We can use a series expansion for the square root of 1 plus x, valid when the absolute value of x is less than or equal to 1. The first three terms of this series expansion are shown here. There are an infinite number of terms, but they get smaller and therefore less important as we go. Okay, so we're going to use that series expansion in our expression for the energy E. The factor of mc squared out front remains unchanged, but we use our series expansion for the case x equals p squared over c squared m squared. We can slightly rearrange terms by multiplying through by the factor of mc squared out front. Okay, so here's the expression we have now. This is still an approximation, but it is a better one than we started with. We kept the largest terms, but left out those which are higher powers of p squared over c squared m squared, and therefore smaller. Now we're ready to compare with the Newtonian expression. Okay, so let's compare our expression that we just derived from special relativity at top with the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy at bottom. The first term in the energy expression from special relativity is the rest energy of the object. In Newtonian mechanics, this is just ignored. The second term we recognize as the kinetic energy from Newtonian mechanics. And then there's a new term. Okay, so question. How good is the Newtonian approximation? 
So we can look at the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy as our spherical cow. And we can look at the Newtonian term plus the new term as our spherical cow that has corrections added. We want to know how big this new term that we typically ignore in everyday scenarios is compared with the Newtonian expression. Okay, so we're comparing the Newtonian expression up top with the Newtonian expression plus correction shown at bottom. Let's look at the fractional size of the correction term compared to the Newtonian expression. So here we take our corrected expression and pull p squared over 2m out front. To see how large the correction is compared to the Newtonian expression, we now look at the second term in parentheses. Now for everyday scenarios, the momentum p is approximately mv. This means that the correction term in parentheses is about minus one quarter v squared over c squared. This means that if we totally ignore special relativistic effects and use the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy, we will get a result that is fractionally off by about minus one quarter v squared over c squared. If we need a precision better than this, the Newtonian expression is not good enough. To illustrate the size of the effect, let's take a plane traveling at 900 kilometers per hour, which is 250 meters per second. The speed of light c is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So v over c is about 8.3 times 10 to the minus 7. The fractional correction, minus 1 quarter v squared over c squared, comes out to about minus 1.7 times 10 to the minus 13. This is tiny. So for the case of our airplane, the Newtonian expression is fine unless we need to know the kinetic energy of this plane to better than two parts in 10 to the 13th. And this precision is only necessary if the measurements of the momentum and mass are similarly precise which is not realistic. So for this case, the Newtonian approximation is fine. For all practical purposes, for the case of our airplane, the Newtonian spherical cow, the spherical cow plus relativistic corrections, and reality are all essentially identical. But our calculation also tells us when the approximation doesn't work. If we have a scenario where we need a fractional error of less than about a quarter v squared over c squared, then the Newtonian approximation is not okay. This means the approximation fails if either high speeds or very precise measurements are involved. Take a spaceship traveling at a speed of one-tenth the speed of light. If we want to know its kinetic energy to 5% precision, the Newtonian expression is fine. If we want a precision of a tenth of a percent, it is not. Okay, so let's summarize. Approximations are an incredibly useful tool for problem solving. But to use it correctly, it is important to know just how good an approximation it is. This involves understanding what effects are included in the approximation and what effects are left out. Then one must have an idea of the size of the effects that are left out to know if they are important for the situation at hand.